Hello there, so I've had a year with my Mazda 6 and in this video I'm going to give you the good, the bad and the ugly of owning the car. I bought a Mazda 6 in, well actually January the 1st, 2020, so right at the beginning of the worst year that we've had for a long time, uh, but I replaced my Jaguar X-Type which I'd had for about seven years. It was starting to go a bit flaky and I thought it was time for a replacement and for some reason I decided that a Mazda 6 seemed like the best value for money, a good mix of an attractive car with lots of technology and features on it. Before I begin, um, actually in a previous video I showed you a huge scratch that I'd got on the car that a lot of you reckon looked like it had been keyed. You're probably right, probably had, probably made some enemies along the way. I bit the bullet, went to a car body shop and got them to repair it for me. Wow, uh, it wasn't quite what I expected. It cost me £493 because it turned out the scratch was so big on that door that you couldn't just respray one door, especially with a silver car, because you would have noticed it too much. Now, you might think, oh, well, you've been ripped off. They told you, you know, to do more work than needed to be done. Well, I actually went to see two independent body shops and both gave me verbatim the same advice. So either they're all conning, which, yeah, I suppose is a possibility, or it kind of needed to be done. And the car's been repaired, and you wouldn't know that it'd been done. I won't be rushing to do that again in a hurry. I think I'm just going to try and park away from people and hope that nobody keys my car again. Anyway, that's the update there. So the lists I'm going to give you is my personal experience. The bad things that I'm going to mention could arguably be due to my specific car. Maybe they're hardware faults that are unique to my car. So, you know, if you get a Mazda 6, you may not experience them, but I'll try where possible to mention whether or not these are things that I've read about on the internet that are, that are problems that other people have encountered. So let's get on with the list. So I'm gonna go from good to bad to ugly, uh, just like the film. Um, and we'll start with good, obviously, the power. So this is a little bit of an odd one, isn't it? Because it's a diesel car, 2.2 litres. Uh, but yeah, the engine's got quite a lot of oomph. So I came from a two litre diesel Jaguar where I could put my foot on the floor and, you know, after a sort of five second delay, I'd accelerate a bit. But this car actually, to some extent, pins me back in my seat. Uh, when I put my foot down. So say I'm going onto a dual carriageway or something, I might on the slip road put my foot down. It's fast enough to accelerate when you need to and related to that, it actually sounds really good. It's got, got a proper sort of growl. I um, owned a Honda several years ago and it sounded a little bit like a cat being strangled. Whereas this actually has a sort of deep growl when you put your foot down you know, okay, possibly the growl doesn't match the acceleration, but it's better than it sounding sort of whiny. So the looks of the car inside and out. Now, I realise this is quite superficial and some people are very practical about their cars. I like a car that looks good. I like the interior styling of this car. In a day and age when a lot of cars are quite bland and uninteresting inside, certainly my model has a real luxury feel to it. It's very well built. I think it looks like it's got a sort of a theme which some cars, some German cars in particular, can just look a little bit like they've just got bits stuck on from different cars. Externally, I think the car is, from a lot of angles, really quite attractive and reminiscent to me at least of the Jaguar XF, which is the car I would have bought if I wanted to spend another six grand on a car. Um, I think the rear of the car is the ugliest view, actually. But yes, the front has a sort of cat styling to it. So this is a bit of a filler one on the list, actually, but it's comfortable and practical. So that is quite important, actually. If you're going to the shops, you don't want to get there and think, oh, I'm glad to get out of the car. Or if you've done a long journey, you don't want it to be arduous. The seats are comfortable. It is pleasant to drive. It's also practical and that is very important actually, because if you get, for example, you bought a, a sports car and then it turned out that it was a bit of a nightmare for your weekly shop, you'd regret your purchase. I haven't regretted this on that front because crucially, 
Compared to my Jaguar X-Type where the seats wouldn't fold down, I can actually fold down the back seats in this car and put very large items in the car if I need to. And the boot is absolutely massive, so no problem storing, shopping and stuff in there. So I've only owned the car one year and about three months, but so far, it has been extremely reliable. I've had no serious problems with the car beyond what I'm gonna talk about in the next couple of lists um, at all. I haven't even had any wear and tear issues, but I think there may be on the horizon some new tires and brakes and things. So far, this car as, as a Japanese manufactured car is living up to its Japanese reputation of being reliable. Now the last item on the list is really the biggest bonus for me and it's the thing that really sways my decision. If, if these things weren't true, then some of the bad points might make me consider changing my car. But the gadgets and the features on my Mazda 6 are absolutely extraordinary and the level of technology is what you would expect on a much more expensive executive car. So let me just give you a little rundown of some of those features. So we've got oh yeah, blind spot detection, which is like actually unbelievable. I didn't realize that I would use this and that I would enjoy it, thought it was a bit of a novelty. Basically, when a car approaches you from a certain angle or there's a car in a certain blind spot, funnily enough, of the car, then you get a little light on your uh, wing mirrors. You don't rely on it entirely, but it's a it's another visual aid to you to help you not kind of pull out and smash into a car. So that's always good, especially when it's a safety feature. But there are other things like the reversing camera, which you become reliant on as well. Um, it's got a heads up display, which is a bit of a novelty. People get in the car and they wonder what that plastic screen is. Incidentally, the newer cars don't actually have that. They project onto the windscreen, which is less showy and uh, you know, therefore probably not as good. But yeah, the heads up display is useful because you only have to sort of glance down to see the speed you're going at. Electronic parking brake, which I rarely use actually, but I, I love the electronic parking brake. It sounds really weird, but the sound of it, it sounds like I'm in like a 747 putting the gear up or something. There's a real electronic whirry noise that sounds powerful. The car's also got start-stop as well, which a lot of people say, you know, is, oh, it'll go wrong. It's particularly bad on the Mazda 6, you know, but just ignore pe what people say on the internet. It's mostly rubbish. I like the start-stop and actually it becomes quite a, a challenge for you. How much can I improve my fuel economy by using the start-stop when I get to the traffic lights? There's a whole host of other features that I haven't talked about, but yeah, it's, it really is a fantastic array of technology. So now we're on to the five bad things, and these are mostly sort of technical problems uh, that I've got with my car that aren't, you know, serious. They're kind of more gremlins than, than actual real big problems. Window demisting I've got here. So, you know, in a car when it's kind of misty or you've got some moisture on the window and you you know, you could get your little car cloth out and leave horrible streaks all over the window. Or you could just roll the window down and then roll it back up again and those little rubber seals along the window will clean the window. Well, on the Mazda 6, they don't do that. You put the window down, you put it back up and you maybe, maybe you'll have a few clear streaks in the window, but generally it just doesn't seem to touch the window. And this is a bit of a technology one, but the, the auto locking on in the car, which is a, you know, it's a good feature. It's a bit futuristic to sort of get out of your car, walk away and the car locks itself. But it gets a little bit wearing when you get out of your car to go and put something on the passenger seat or get something out of the rear of the car. And by the time you've walked around to the back of the car, the car's locked itself and you've got to unlock it again. There's also a little bit of a quirk and I can't tell whether or not it's just the way I'm using the car, where sometimes the car takes three separate unlocks to actually get in the car, like I haven't actually locked it properly in the first place. So this seems to be a problem that I've seen a lot of people report, but my driver's side heated seat doesn't seem very effective. Okay, it definitely is heating up, sort of, but I've sat in the passenger seat and turned that on and that seat gets a lot hotter. So I think maybe the heating elements are broken or there's some wiring broken or something. It's a bit disappointing because I like a toasty bum when it's cold. Second to last here is GPS. Now, 
I did notice actually a couple of days ago that I've got a, a fault with the GPS antenna on my car or something. And I'd be really interested to know if you're a Mazda 6 owner, whether or not you get the same thing. But my GPS, my word, doesn't it update slowly? I can go round a roundabout, come off a roundabout, and the GPS will still have me going round the roundabout. And because of that slowness, it can then actually misinterpret my location and have me driving on one of the other turnoffs. Um, and then eventually it'll sort itself out. But yeah, it just seems dangerously unreliable. But by far the top thing on my list, my biggest problem or fault with the car at the moment is to do with the infotainment system and the touchscreen. And this is something that I've seen reported quite a lot. Now, I've just done a firmware update to see if that gets rid of it, but apparently there is some kind of delamination problem that can occur with moisture getting between the panels or something in the infotainment touchscreen. And the result is something called a ghost touch. So essentially the screen will touch itself, which sounds wrong, doesn't it? But what's the worst thing you could expect a car to start doing that you wouldn't want it to do while you were driving along in the road? Yes, you're right, ring your boss. And that's exactly what my car has been doing. It rings previous people I've called, um, and it doesn't just do it once, it just gets into a little bit of a tizzy and starts doing it over and over and over and over again. And you panic because you're driving and you think, what do I do, do I stop, do I turn my phone off, do I try and hang up? Um, and the only way and this is what leads me to believe that maybe it was slightly firmware related, is that actually if you turn the car off and then turn it on again, it doesn't seem to happen again, which doesn't seem to suggest it's a kind of mechanical thing or physical problem. It only happens sporadically and I'll see if it gets worse, but yeah, absolutely detest that fault. Now we're on to the lesser things, the kind of ugly things, things I'm not super keen on, but aren't really problematic. And the first is I bought a silver car and I wish I'd bought the red version of this car. Now, silver was all that's available for me in my local area for the price that I was willing to pay um, with that level of technology. So I couldn't get the sort of cherry red one that I keep seeing around when I drive in my car. But uh, yeah, I wish I'd got the red one because I think it's slightly more attractive. The cost of an official service. I was due a service in the summer and I made a video about how I went to Halfords and it wasn't the best experience. Well, that's the reason I went down that route actually was because the Mazda service was something like 550 quid, um, which seems like a huge amount for a service. Of course, if you're like a Mercedes driver, that probably seems really, really cheap. Now the audio system, which is a real kind of selling feature of the car. People love the sort of twisty knob and the buttons. I find it a little bit clunky, to be honest. It's actually quite difficult to get to the menus you want to get to. The buttons around the twisty knob can be quite difficult to identify while you're driving along because you don't want to be doing that and looking down. The road noise on the car is a little bit louder than I would like. The car itself is quite quiet. You can't really hear the engine unless you're putting your foot down. But yeah, there's quite a lot of noise from the tires. I, I guess maybe changing the tires would affect that. But I just think that maybe the soundproofing in the car isn't quite as good as it could be. And again, related to the infotainment and audio system, another common fault which I've seen described on the internet is that the bass speakers, they rust, and they come apart and the result is a sort of flapping sound when you get bass signals in your music. And I can confirm that I think I have that problem because if I've got any bass at all, at certain volumes, all I hear is the door vibrating. I don't actually hear really the bass. So that's a bit of a pain. And to fix it, you, which is quite easy to do, but I have to take the door apart. Actually, I should say with a lot of these things, these aren't faults that have developed over the course of the last year. I'm pretty certain these are, these are faults that were there from the beginning. Perhaps these are reasons why the person sold the car in the first place. A couple of extra points uh, here about firstly fuel economy on the car. So I was quite down on fuel economy when I first made a video about the Mazda 6. Um, and I've changed my mind a little bit. Uh, because I basically believed the blurb I'd read online that, you know, it'd be 48 miles to the gallon or whatever on a on a dual carriageway. And, you know, I kind of struggled to get 36 driving around, but I've accepted it because 
actually I do put my foot down a few times so it's kind of down to me really a lot of it you know if I'm going to accelerate onto a dual carriageway then I can't expect the fuel economy to be fantastic and finally something that I'm going to do in the coming weeks um, I've just updated the firmware on the car as I said which is quite a easy process actually but if you're going to do it be very careful and I don't take responsibility for you screwing up your car but I've just bought quite an expensive cable that will allow me to connect my iPhone to the car, which I can do already, but it'll basically allow me to um, turn the infotainment system into Apple CarPlay. So the, the LCD screen just becomes a little iPhone. So you can play Spotify and all sorts of things in your car. Don't really need to do it, but it's just a feature that I would like added to my car. It's a little project for me to do. Got to take some of the, the um, faces and things out of the car to get to actually do that, which I'm a little bit nervous about, but I've got all the correct tools. So I may make a video on that because I think that could be a useful tutorial video. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this sort of summary video about my ownership of the car during the last year. Thank you to my loyal Patreons who are scrolling down the screen now, especially George Foote, Magnanimous Meg, Jennifer Jones, Jim McCaig, and that's all of them, I think. Thank you very much. Do subscribe if you enjoy my videos and I shall see you next time for another one.